Foundation and I'm extremely pleased to welcome you all today for the international conference Breaking the Barriers here in Sofia. I'm also extremely pleased that you were able to find the French Institute because there's a bit of reconstruction going on outside. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, uh, today's event is actually part of a much larger project uh, named uh, Come Forward. Empowering and supporting victims of anti-LGBT crimes, which started in 2016 and uh, is continuing now as we as we talk. It's developed in a consortium by 22 partners from 10 uh, EU member states, and uh, it aims at uh, increasing the number of dedicated frontline reporting centers, improving access to victims, strengthening cross-border uh, partnerships raising awareness, and last but not least, empowering the victims. Over 1,000 professionals from across Europe will be trained or are already trained with the framework of the project by the end of this year and uh, with the use of a specially prepared uh, training curriculum. And this means really like 1,000 people across Europe who are now able to offer support and uh, safe space, help or just listen. The project is co-funded by the European Commission's REC program, DigiJustice, and thank you all for being active in this project, and thank you all to the consortium and everyone who made it to all the monthly Zoom calls. And uh, some uh, practicalities. The conference, as you know, will go for a day and a half, and uh, you have the program in the folders. We have the volunteers here with us and I want to thank them and whatever question you have just go out, outside and ask them. Uh, also I want to give recognition to Demeter and the whole team of GLASS for actually putting this conference to a successful completion and the French Institute for the magnificent thing. Uh, I know there are probably two things that interest you a lot, the Wi-Fi and the lunch. Uh, the Wi-Fi codes are on the back of the program, the last page, and the lunch will be served in another venue. That's the municipal library, so when you go outside, the building to the right. Again, the volunteers will be there to assist you, and I hope you're not going to get lost. The workshop, uh, workshop rooms are uh, located uh, on the floors above us, and uh, the workshops will take place in the afternoon. So um, we're going to show you around and ask for the lecture. And I wanted to tell you a story. Um, on an ordinary day like this, early night in 2018, in 2008, a guy was walking through the central park in Sofia. He is 25 years old, has been studying all day, and just wants to take a break. He's kissing his mother goodbye and saying he'll be back soon. It's just that he never returned. A group of skinheads are, in their own words, cleaning the park from faggots. And they see Mikhail and attack him brutally, presuming that he is gay. A fist in the head came first. Then, while Mikhail is on the ground, the two guys continuously for two minutes are beating him up, pressing his face in the pavement. After that, they stole his phone. Mikhail died right there. The murderers remained unknown for um, two years after the brutal hate crime and were caught by accident by the authorities with the, same, with the same stolen phone in them. Another three more years were necessary to get enough evidence and press charges. Exactly ten years after this cruel murder, the perpetrators went to prison with reduced sentences following the decision of the Supreme Court and this June 2018, they were sentenced to 10 and four and a half years of prison for the murder. The mother of Mikhail is saying that she has been dead ever since, and that there is no law in Bulgaria. She is right, but for one. The current Bulgarian legislation doesn't recognize the victims of transphobic or homophobic crimes, and it doesn't send the perpetrators the message that the sexual orientation and the gender identity cannot be a cause of harm. This is why this conference today is so significant, not just for us as activists, not just for the local government, not just for the European Union, but I believe for the mother of Mikhail, and for every other mother who can be in her shoes one day. To commemorate the 10th year anniversary of the 10th year uh, from the murder of Mikhail, we are doing a walk today 
that starts 5 p.m. from here and we're gonna walk to the Borisova Garden, the place where the murder happened. I urge you all to join us um, since you're gonna be sitting here the whole day and a bit of work will, uh, uh, will not do you harm. Uh, there are two options, you can walk to the park, there are maps and the volunteers uh, will guide us or uh, if you feel tired and, and don't want to walk, you can uh, again, um, the volunteers will give you tickets for the, um, uh, the bus that you can use. And uh, with this, I really want to wish you all a fruitful conference and actually also the courage to fix what's broken in our societies. And uh, I want to give the floor to uh, the Deputy Ombudswoman and uh, Ex-Minister of Justice, Mr. Dian Kovacevov. Dear ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm very honored to be part of this uh, special conference. I did not realize that uh, the language will be English, the working language, but uh, and I have prepared my speech in Bulgarian. Uh, I, however, no, I'll, I'll just try to do it in English, since this is the spirit of the conference uh, in the French Institute. I feel fine with this. Um, so thank you very much to the organizers uh, for the invitation to the institution of the Ombudsman in Bulgaria. I would first like to start by um, sending you the warm greetings of Mrs. Monova, the Ombudsman of the Republic of Bulgaria. Unfortunately, due to another engagement, she is unable to be here today. Uh, however, I'm representing the institution and the reassurance uh, that we very much support uh, your cause, the human rights protection, and this is actually a very important task of the institution of the Ombudsman. I think the topic of uh, the, the international conference today is extremely important because it is related to the implementation, to the exercise of the important human rights, such as rights related to the human dignity, to the right of family and personal life, to the freedom of thought, speech, sexual orientation, religion, uh, non-discrimination, and of course, the access to justice. Um, it is a known principle of the law that actually all human rights are indivisible. They are one. So when you infringe one right, you actually infringe all of them. Um, all rights are equally important. The, rights, the human rights are one of the important pillars of the rule of law. And it is not uh, a random choice that a big number of international organizations like the UN, like the EU, uh, like the OSCE, um, are actually pointing out uh, the human rights as a very significant value that they defend in their statutes and in the founding treaties. Uh, they also note, these organizations, they note that uh, um, the important task of protecting human rights is a very significant, um, a very significant obligation on the international law of each state that adheres to an international treaty. So whenever a state fails to defend any citizen, any human right, it is actually failing an obligation under the international law, which is a very serious issue. Crime, the crimes of hate are in the focus of the institution of the Ombudsman uh, for many years now, uh, especially moreover because they are not so much recognizable in society. Uh, there are many reasons for this, and these reasons are quite complex. Uh, sometimes um, it is due to the lack of sensibility, to the lack of awareness, to the lack of tolerance. Sometimes it is due to the existence of prejudices, which is a very important problem. Um, and sometimes it is because we don't very much give so much value to the needs uh, of the person next to us, because his or her needs are equally important to any other person's needs, even when they are different from our own. The, crime, the hate crimes are actually touching, affecting very seriously human dignity. And uh, unfortunately, like any other crime, they have many ugly assets. 
European, the European Court on Human Rights is actually saying in many of its judgments, and it is a constant practice right now, that the existence of prejudices as a motive for commitment of a crime um, is actually an infringement of Article 14 from the European Convention of Human Rights. Because the motives to commit a crime, a hate crime, um, in its essence, in its heart, are related to the lack of respect to human personality, to human person, uh, to human dignity, and always they are one step to open the door to horrible violence, as was the case that we started with. And this is not an isolated case, unfortunately. These crimes, all crimes, hate crimes, all of them should be criminalized. And this is absolutely the position of the institution of the Ombudsman. They should be effectively investigated, punished. The victims should receive justice and also should receive compensation for what they have suffered. Usually the hate crimes start from the hate speech and there is a very close link between them. Because you start with hate speech and then you start hurting. And usually this is not only humiliating, this can kill. The lack of legislation and efficient legislation and efficient mechanisms for protection of these crimes actually makes a gap and prevents from punishing of people who are guilty of committing such crimes but this also prevents the prevention of such crimes. It also prevents the raising awareness in society that this is a problem, that this behavior is not something common, this is a crime. In its report, the FRA, the Agency of the European Union um, for Human Rights, is actually making the statement that despite of its efforts, the member states of the European Union to contradict, to, to, uh, to prevent the discrimination and the lack of tolerance uh, are actually not doing quite a good job. Unfortunately, this is uh, a conclusion which we can definitely support. Um, the crimes that are related to hate crimes are not actually efficiently regulated and the situation is not getting better in the greater part of the member states of the EU. Uh, the difficulty is also um, uh, deepened by the fact that usually the victims are not so much willing to share information about the fact that they are victims of violence based on hate and discrimination. Um, and this, this is because they feel discouraged. Sometimes they feel discouraged by the attitude of the institutions uh, by the fact that the institutions themselves don't recognize the hate crimes uh, and they don't know how to react in such cases. This is how the, the persons who are victims of such crimes are actually unwilling to share information, first because they don't think so, that something will change, but also because they are afraid of more violence that can happen to them, sometimes even from the institutions. They don't see the understanding of the issue. This is also very discouraging. Um, according to this report of FRA agency, uh, only eight states out of the, all the member states, out of 28 right now at member states, are having registers for information on hate crimes. Only eight out of 28. Actually, Bulgaria is unfortunately among the states that don't have good statistics, if they have statistics at all, about hate crimes. Uh, and this is actually a, a hindrance to receiving uh, real, the real picture, information on the real picture uh, about um, the, the spread of this problem. So this year, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe um, has issued um, a report, or should I say a statement, which is analyzing uh, the current legislation of Bulgaria, uh, namely this is the criminal code. And this is quite an important report. I think it should be taken into consideration by the institutions when they actually start um, not only thinking about, but also taking steps about uh, amending the legislation in view of really criminal
vandalizing all different types of homophobic and other crimes which we called general hate crimes, but they're really different and should be separated distinctly. Um, I should say that uh, breaking barriers is a difficult task. It's not easy. Uh, it requires, of course, concrete actions. It requires courage. But it also requires serious public support. This is why talking about the problems is very important. Naming the problem, they say, is the first step to solving it. But in addition to talking about the problem, I think it's very important to have like some concrete steps um, to cut the crimes, the hate crimes, and their commitment. Because we very often now uh, confront cases of multiple discrimination. So we don't only speak about one type of discrimination, one type of hate crime, they're kind of multiple. Um, and it's getting more and more obvious. Um, this is why we have to remind ourselves that uh, it is very important to um, criminalize the crimes, but it's also very important to have efficient implemented, efficiently implemented legislation. Because sometimes you write down something, you put it in the criminal code, and this is where it stays. Um, it is very important to analyze the problems, and I very much recognize the report that you have made. You know, it's, it gives a very clear picture about the problem and should be used as a basis for developing further steps, policies, and strategic approaches to the problem. It's very important to, um, to, to, to look and to identify the specific needs of the victims. It's very important to change the uh, tendencies in society. It's very important to find adherents and supporters. And it's very important to stimulate the victims of violence to speak about what they have survived. Last but not least, in my opinion, it's very important to have the understanding of the institutions that the, pro the, the solving of the problem is in their hands. So, by these words, um, I'm showing the support of the institution of the Ombudsman. Um, I think that it's very important um, audience here and the discussion about this problem would maybe push a little bit further uh, the whole situation closer to the moment when it can actually start to be solved. So I wish you all the best of luck and every success um, with this conference today and I hope that um, you will have the courage to break the barrier Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Ms. Kovacva. I believe with an ally like you, breaking the barriers will be a bit easier. Thank you so much for the, for the address. Now I want to give the floor to uh, Vesta Meida from the European Commission Directorate to address the audience. Yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation as well. Very uh, happy to be here uh, today uh, with you. So my name is Weston Meno and uh, I work for the European Commission. And in my role, I uh, coordinate the Commission's list of actions to advance LGBTI equality, which was presented by Commissioner Jourova, uh, the Commissioner for uh, Justice, Consumer and Gender Equality in 2015 and combating hate crime and hate speech based on sexual orientation and gender identity are very important topics in the list of actions. But before going more into detail, I would also like to have a look at the current political circumstances uh, in Europe, which not always seem to favor equality policies. There's a broad, broad movement that has gained strength that too often favors more simple national solutions above international cooperation and it is also a movement that not always seems to respect the values of equality, non-discrimination and diversity that we hold so dear in the European Union. Um, let it be very clear that the European Commission stands for equality. Equality is enshrined in the founding treaties and it is a core value of the European Union. The European Commission will defend these values at all times and at all places. Uh, but besides having to be careful and watchful, I also think there is reason for optimism. Uh, let's not forget that, for instance, a majority of 71% of European citizens indicate that they favor equal rights for LGBTI people. Uh, and more countries, and more and more countries, are providing forms of legal recognition for same-sex couples. 
However, of course, the differences between the member states is very hard. And uh, there are member states, like, for instance, Bulgaria, that I score below the European average. So the picture here is very mixed, but there are enough developments that should, us, should, that should give us the strength and confidence that more open and tolerant societies are in reach. Um, the Commission's list of actions includes a number of actions that combat hate crime and hate, hate speech, um, including based on sexual orientation and gender identity. This is extremely important for us because simply everybody should feel safe when being in public and with being in public I don't only mean on the streets, outside, in the park, the very unfortunate uh, incident, but also online, you should feel safe and uh, to give your own opinion and not be intimidated. Um, and whether to, uh, but I also have to say that whether uh, to consider a homophobic or transphobic motive an aggravating circumstance when a crime occurs or whether to criminalize homophobic or transphobic hate speech is up to each member state itself to decide under national law. Uh, we are pleased as a commission that currently a vast majority of 21 member states uh, criminal law uh, legislation already covers homophobic and transphobic hate crime and we encourage the other member states to include this in the legislation as well. Um, we do this through numerous uh, efforts, for instance through our high level group on combating racism, xenophobia and other forms of intolerance so that we bring the issue to the member states so that they see what is happening in the other member states and that they uh, feel a sort of uh, feel motivated to uh, include the same measures as well. Um, we support civil society projects, for instance, like uh, the one uh, where the conference uh, uh, is part of uh, today. And for instance, online we also have a major uh, memorandum of understanding with the major IT companies to delay, delete hate speech that is online as soon as possible. So basically that the internet stays free of uh, hate speech and I think improvements are being made but nevertheless we unfortunately we are still in a situation I would say that people online behave much worse than <laughs> offline um, um, and uh, what is of course extremely important also from the European Commission uh, perspective is that when people become victim of anti-LGBTI hate crime that they need to have proper access uh, to justice um, therefore, the Commission would like to underline the importance of the proper transposition and implementation of the Victims' Rights Directive by the Member States. This directive, this instrument, if applied correctly in Member States, is a great achievement for strengthening protection and support to all victims of crime, provided that an act is criminalized under national law. It is applicable before, during and after criminal proceedings. It requires that all victims are treated in a sensitive, professional, tailored and non-discriminatory manner. The directive contains several specific provisions on, prote on protection of victims and recognition of victims with specific needs, which is crucial for, partic for particularly vulnerable victims. It is essential that member states take the necessary measures to protect victims and their family members from secondary and repeated victimization, from intimidation and from retaliation. Member states are under an obligation to ensure that victims receive a timely and individual assessment to identify specific protection needs. This individual assessment is crucial as LGBTI people can be particularly vulnerable to crimes committed with a bias or discriminatory motive related to their personal characteristics. This assessment is also important for LGBTI victims to identify the true extent of the crime. This is often disregarded in cases of bias-motivated crimes. Um, the Commission is currently analyzing the state of implementation of the Victims' Rights Directive in all the EU member states. And in 2019, we will publish a report on how the member states have transposed the directive. Um, and there are two other uh, things I would like to highlight 
for 2019, which are very important from our uh, perspective of the Commission. First of all, uh, in May 2019, there will of course be the elections uh, for the European Parliament. I can only encourage you to go and vote, and vote for what you think is important. Um, and secondly, we, uh, from the Commission, since we have uh, published the list of actions, next year we will also uh, start a stakeholder consultation to get feedback on what has been done, but also to hear, of course, what needs to be done. And of course, we're open for positive feedback, but we also need critical feedback on what can be improved and uh, what is the way uh, forward. Um, so I really invite, next it's a bit far away still, but I really invite the LGBTI community and especially also the LGBTI NGOs, but also for instance institutes like the Ombudsman, the Commission for Discrimination, to participate in this stakeholder uh, consultation because we need to hear your views about what is going on, how and what is going on in the countries, in the member states, but also how we perceive our policies. Um, to conclude, I would like to say that we need to change the attitudes of people. We need to make them realize that equality policies and legislation is not more merely something for minorities. We need to make people realize that equality policies are not something luxurious, but that they are crucial for all, since almost everyone at some point in their life has a personal trait which seems to differ from the majority. Or they have family members, friends, colleagues who need protection from discrimination. We really believe it is important to get that message uh, across to show that major that equality policy is really important for every individual in society. Um, for now, I would really like to thank you for your attention. I wish you a very uh, fruitful uh, conference. I'll be at least here today for lunch. You might also join later and a bit tomorrow. So really, feel free to approach me if you have some questions or you want to highlight something or uh, discuss uh, something uh, with me. So thank you very much.